that's it. Thank you. Joe, jo, has anybody done any tissue pathology on any of these? Yeah, I just got an email from Maida. So that we know, I know a biologist in, um, in, she's in Jacksonville. And so she's, I, she's worked with you guys a little bit about looking at tissue samples from fish moving around in Clark Fork. Um, I'm not clear on if she's interested in these fish or not. Yeah, we're still kind of working out. Yeah, working so, out, so. just thought about it. Copper binds fairly strongly to, to kill tissue. What's that? Copper binds fairly <laughs> strongly to kill tissue. Mm -hmm. I think so. Did you guys do toxicology from those fish gate studies? Sorry. Um, oh, no. Oh, the, uh, they ended up, they have to be preserved. When you're doing any kind of, you know, you got to preserve them within a couple minutes of dying. And we had a few definitely showed, you know, metals impacts on the gills, but a lot of them were just too old to, to tell too much from. But Did you guys look at the... Um, the livers of the fish that were that where there was mortality because there's probably some information that shows that enzymatic liver functions get screwed up by metal contamination. I don't know what it is. I know what yeah. the pretty bad, but the copper is. We, we do metal analysis on the livers to look at the, look at the different levels, on, um, but that's that's about how we how we do most of our I, I do want to maybe point out too while I have the chance is um. We're going to be sampling fish this summer for, for a, from a human health perspective to look at the metal concentrations in the tissues. It's a question people all, often ask: is like, how would you, why would you ever eat a fish out of there, kind of thing? But I know Matt would. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things to remember is that the, the Clark Fork Five metals, the big metals of concern that killed all the fish off in this drainage, the copper, cadmium, zinc, arsenic. They typically don't accumulate in the actual edible tissue to levels that are typically a concern. There are a few cases in the country where there's arsenic levels that issue uh, advisor on, but what typically happens is mercury is a global pollutant, and you know even residual mercury in the landscape will result in tissue contaminations that will result in you know lower fish consumption advisors than any of the residual metals that are actually in the system. But we are going to test all of them this summer. Um, we haven't obviously tested them since this, since you know there were no fish in there previously, but. Uh, I should have results out by mid, mid to late summer, and we'll make sure we get those to you right away and let you know where we're standing as far as that, as that stands. So. Trevor, that does include mercury then? Yeah, yeah, we will. We'll be looking at all the metals as well as selenium and mercury. So, Because with the Osprey study, mercury was the only thing that was really bioaccumulated. It was, yeah, and, and the, going down the Clark Fork, there was definitely a, little, a lot more mercury picking up when you get, got down to Flint Creek area. So. It's a lot of mercury. But there's something that I think is, is encouraging that we see. Um, so this to me is a really interesting part of the stream. So this is uh, where brown sculpt comes in. So the stream picks up some water. Uh, this is remediated, and this section is remediated. And you couldn't tell other than just discharge. You wouldn't be able to walk up this and tell. And I've tried to do some habitat surveys and you know, sort of determine what's a pool, count pools, and do some of this. And I couldn't do it because I couldn't reliably determine what was a pool and what was a riffle because it was, the stream was so homogenous. But in spite of that, we see not only trout, we see west slopes in this section of the stream. And you know, I think that's very encouraging. Uh, the other part is that the lower area one section um, starts right here. It's, well, what I call it starts with the treatment plant and extends right to, this is a slag canyon we can sample there, but it's, it's pretty high abundance of trout in that restored section. One thing I noticed that they did in LAO was they put a lot of rocks as breaks, and I wonder if that's for, is it, I don't know, you notice these are big yeah. boulders? Yeah, yeah, particularly down at that last yeah. 200 meters. Yeah, that's the only part of that. Yeah. It's a drop, it's a drop uh, strip. But there is different the substrate. So the yeah. substrate is gravelly and cobbly, and you get down here, even here, I mean, the substrate is mostly sandy, silty stuff. And, and still, we have less silty stuff.
don't see any trends. That we can, you know, it's all overwhelmed by the oxygen, obviously. But uh, yeah. Now another thing to keep in mind: we sampled in July, and west slopes are spring spawners. So these fish may have been sort of have moved around. We know they move around a lot during the spring. They may just be remnants, but this is quite a ways after. We would expect them to be spawning. That's sort of what the stream is. I mean, I mean, generally in a sort of low gradient stream that flows across the valley, you'd expect a lot of silt. You know, if you look at, I, I sort of always think of Browns Gulch. So Browns Gulch was not impacted. Some of the lower end has been rebuilt. But when you look at Browns Gulch, you see a very narrow stream channel that meanders a lot. There's a lot of complexity in there, and there's a lot of beavers. Uh, that's something that tends to deepen Beaver activity tends to hold sediment and build channel, you know, channel units like pools and, and lots of braids. And, and there's there's quite a few brook trout in, in Browns Gulch. So I guess, I don't know if I answered it. Question. I, d I don't think they're going to be limited by sediment. I, I think maybe what you're trying to get at too is in the main stem sediments are, are fairly fine and they're not probably the best for trout reproduction and that's gonna the, the tributaries are imperative and, and that's where our trout are going to spawn i mean that's why german gulch is probably producing most of the fish that you're seeing in the lower end of silverboat creek is coming from there and that's where all the spawning is occurring there's a that brings up another point so when we do these mobile antenna surveys the fish will sometimes lose the tags and generally do, they do it as they're spawning so they actually these tags which we insert into the their abdomen, they will actually go into the gonads and they'll pass them as they're spawning. Uh, this upper section right in here is Blacktail Creek in Father Sheehan. There's a lot of groundwater there, and we find all kinds of shed tags, so they're not, I don't set them here, but we know they're shed because when we scan the tag, it doesn't move, and you're able to sort of determine that it's not a live fish. That tends to be a very good indication of spawning sites, and we find a lot of them in Father Sheehan Park. So there's a lot more substrate variability up there. Yeah. So, so there are, I mean, you know, Black, Father Sheehan isn't that far away from Silverboat, so it's another important source area. And so that's, that's, you know, that's all this giant awful fish fishes too. These are the live fish that we captured. That's that same section. Yeah. Any, any anomalies in gender ratios you <laughs> fish below? Sewage outfall. <laughs> <laughs> I don't look that way. We process a lot of fish, so I don't want to sex them out. Um, we do have, though, um, and there's a photo, so I have a, I have a poster on the back wall, and I do a, we do hot, find a pretty high incidence of gill deformities in black tail creeks. Um, yeah, and it tends to be, it's like 20, 25%. I mean, it's, it's significant. There's, I've not found it in the literature that I found uh, a similar study out up in Alberta where they they, they see the same proportion of brook trout with this same condition, and it's a selenium impacted stream. Um, but I haven't found it with copper. I don't know if it's just a family trait of these. That could be just a normal anomaly, but when it's a silver boat, it makes you think, or black tail. So, so, yeah, there's a photo of that, but it's just far as sex, I'm not sure. So we have antennas, so what I have presented, we have stationary antennas 
that little talisman fish move past this point, past this point, past this point, past this point. Past this point. And it's trickier data to sort of decipher. But we should be able to interpret where these fish are going, and you know, at least on some level, where they're coming from and where they're going to. Um, our guess, my guess, is that most of German Gulch downstream is a cutthroat source, and we assume these fish are coming from German Gulch. Um, but never know. So hopefully we can sort of tease that out with those fixed antennas. Do they seem like they're a little more um, tolerant of the West Slope cutthroat? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure which species would be more tolerant or less. I wouldn't think they'd be more tolerant. Say they'd be less time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Less, but I think they both fairly similar. <coughs> yeah. You know, my advisors pointed out that even though it's restored, this part of the stream looks, he's sort of a cutthroat guy. And he said, this kind of looks like a slow cutthroat water. It's just low gradient, sort of open water. Whereas this, and you know, in my experience with brook trout, upper blacktail creek does look like brook trout water. Um, so maybe just species preference explains some of that. You know, this is a curious little batch of west slopes here. Right? This is immediately below the treatment plant, and this is the mixing zone. So in one side of the stream, you could be getting effluent, and you have fish or pear. So one of the things about nutrients is that it makes a very, very productive stream. So um, in, low, in low levels, nutrients are of benefit to fisheries. Um, there's lots of examples. Like the Bow River in Alberta is famous for getting sort of just enough effluent to increase the productivity of the stream, and it makes this very, very productive trout fishery. But when it gets to be too much, and you can have these hypoxia problems. But on the other hand, suckers clearly are more tolerant than hypoxia. But it also creates very high, really incredible growth of algae and secondary destruction. And that's all stuff that suckers feed on. And, and the one thing I would say is that when I see these trout, they look to me to be very healthy. I mean, they look big. You know, the fish that Matt showed, those, those west slopes, those are pretty healthy looking fish. So the, the fish that can tolerate sort of the conditions have the benefit of this subsidy of nutrients, which probably dramatically increases the cost of the competition. Yeah, I was going to say, it's got like a fat net in this. Yeah, my advisor. Right yeah. He's in Australia, so. <laughs> <laughs> Does that answer your question? Any more questions? Joe, Thank Matt, thanks very much. short 10 minute break and for those that are interested in the document review, uh, please stick around and if you're here for extra credit you can go home now. <laughs>